Leipzig, Germany. Located 90 miles southwest of Berlin, this quiet city on the Rhine River is called Music City by its residents, as it was home to several world-renowned composers. Long divided by religion and politics, Leipzig was subjected to Allied air raids during World War II and for years remained closed off from the rest of the world. A unified Germany has again put Leipzig on the map, and in 2006, the city was chosen as a host for soccer's World Cup. Just one month later, it plays host to a different kind of game. The Video Game. Welcome to the Leipziger Messe Convention Center, a state-of-the-art facility that is host to this year's games convention. Hundreds of thousands of frenzied fans will enter these hallowed halls to partake in interactive demos, catch a sneak peek of the newest video game releases, and the very best in professional tournaments. Some are even camping outside so as not to miss a thing. Today, we bring you the Guild Wars Factions Championship, where the top six teams from all over the globe have earned the chance to battle for over $100,000 in cash and prizes. The field is wide open as three days of Guild Wars competition is about to begin. Guild Wars has pretty much taken me where I've always wanted to be. I mean, I've always wanted to leave the U.S. You can make a bit of money from it. It's a nice bonus. It's a fun holiday. I came, came with the bus from the airport. I thought I'm in Helsinki. The architecture is very similar to Helsinki. Yeah, similar feeling, good feeling. So, so far, it's been awesome. Uh, they have really great public transportation here in Leipzig, so we've been able to get around, and there's a lot of cool stuff to see. It's, I'm surprised. It's a lot smaller, more convenient here as well. It is a beautiful place. I love it. Leipzig is a curious city, but a lot of it seems new. And, well, half of it's new, and then there's random roadworks, building works going in the middle of the streets. I think it was bombed a lot during the war. It has a lot to do with it. <laughs> we, we go up there and we're playing for fun and we really enjoy ourselves and you know if we lose we're like whatever we got a free trip to Germany. Being over here in Europe's awesome. It was always been a dream since childhood to be over here. I, I don't think a game can do much more for me. Now that we've met some of our teams, let's find out more about Guild Wars and how you play the game. Guild Wars at its highest competitive level is a PvP game, which is player on player, where you have a team of eight players versus another team of eight players, and then each player has eight skills. So there's a total of 64 skills on the team. It's really unique. It's, um, so it's a traditional, almost like a fantasy setting. So dragons and uh, mages and magic. There are two bases, and people fight uh, between those. And People try to kill each other with um, different kind of ways. You essentially strategize with your teammates and pick out 64 skills that you want to use and you fight this other team uh, in, a, in a guild map. Uh, the game launches and there's a flag stand in the center of the map. And so it's, it's kind of almost uh, like a capture the flag game going on in the center. And there's a character called a guild board and that is a non-player character that is the king of your castle essentially. And then just eventually some team dies and the guild lord dies and the game is done. They're supposed to run into the center of the map at 35 minutes. Um, but it's, it's an end game to force it so games don't go for hours and hours and hours. So gamers you know, don't die of exhaustion. Let's recap how the game is played. The main objective of Guild Wars is to kill your opponent's guild lord. Competitive play pits two teams of eight players. After being killed, Players resurrect after two minutes, though with compromised strength due to the death penalty. A morale boost can be obtained by holding your flag stand for two minutes. If both teams are still standing at the 30 minute mark, the game moves to victory or death when both guild lords run into the center of the map for a final showdown. Before we get to the competition, let's recap the first world championship that was held in Taipei in February 2006. Six teams were invited from Europe, North America, and Asia to compete in the first Guild vs. Guild tournament of its kind. In the semifinals, the Finnish team Valendor lost to War Machine of Korea. Who is the winner of this match? Winner, War Machine. 
While in other action, Idiot Savants, the American regional champions, lost to the Korean team last Pride. And in the finals, we saw War Machine take on last Pride in an all-Korean matchup. The teams pushed to a decisive game three. Last Pride made jaws drop in the 21st minute, overpowering three players in a row to boost their morale and propel them to the Guild Lord, who they took down just four minutes later. It was a hard-fought final, but in the end, it was Last Pride who was crowned the first ever Guild Wars World Champion. After Last Pride took gold in the first World Championship, the second season was about to begin with a whole new campaign. Guild Wars Factions. Introducing the realm of Cantha, Factions brings a new group of professions, skills, and maps to the Guild Wars universe. Leading up to the Guild Wars Factions Championship, guilds competed online in three one-month seasons. Out of 700 teams that competed, the top five guilds earned a berth to Leipzig. Here are the winners of each season. In the season one final, Last Pride again took down War Machine 2-0 in a fantastic rematch from Taipei. In the second seasonal playoff, we saw a monumental upset as Sacrament of the Waru quickly dispatched Idiot Savants 2-0 in the opening round. Also in season two, world champions and number one seed Last Pride took on number 16, Black Widow. In game two of their match, Last Pride had the Widow's Guild Lord on the ropes, but couldn't get it done. Minutes later, Black Widow took control and chased Last Pride across the lava field, ganking their Guild Lord. Black Widow took it two games to zero, providing a stunning upset to the Korean powerhouse. In the Season 2 final, newly formed Finnish team Irresistible Blokes took on the mixed European squad, Esoteric Warriors. The Blokes were riding high from besting War Machine 2-0 in the semis, but couldn't keep up with Esoteric Warriors. In Game 3, tied 1-1, Esoteric Warriors took control in the final minutes to beat the Finns and gain a spot in the championship. And in the final of Season 3, it was Last Pride once again beating their Korean counterparts, War Machine. Despite the loss, War Machine maintained the highest points total and is the number one seed here in Leipzig, making Last Pride the number two seed. In the middle of the pack, it's Irresistible Blokes and Esoteric Warriors from Europe with the Americans, Treacherous Empires, the fifth seed. The sixth seed goes to the American squad, Idiot Savants, who qualified by winning the wildcard tournament. Let's head back to Leipzig. I'm Eamon McEnany, joined by Isaiah Cartwright. Izzy and I will be calling all the matches here at the Guild Wars Factions Championship. But before we get underway, let's meet the teams in the first matchup. Uh, well, I work full time. I do uh, IT security consulting. So got out of school and uh, had about a four month period where I was uh, sort of waiting around for a job and going to interviews and things like that. And that's when I really got into Guild Wars. You know, it's kind of it's kind of bad when you're at work and you're stressing out about your video game practice that night instead of thinking about your work. I really like the competitive aspect. I really like the it's really strategic and it's it's almost like a sport in a sense. You have a team and you've got to come up with strategies. We've got only one self-declared pro gamer, so all the rest of us are either students going to school full time or working full time jobs, and still trying to go out on the weekends and go to the bars and meet girls and things like that. So. <laughs> In all honesty, we're probably not the best technical players, as uh, you know, we don't hit the buttons at the fastest or necessarily respond the best, but we do sort of go into the matches without any... We're willing to play whatever will win. When teams play us, they don't necessarily know what we're going to run. Some teams are very predictable, they always play the same thing, and we try to constantly change what we're playing. Now just trying to juggle the job, normal life, and video gaming, and trying to get the most out of everything. Idiot Savants stand out because they will run unpredictable builds with lots of hidden strategies. They are clear underdogs which will make them dangerous because they have nothing to lose. Look for them to use the element of surprise to their advantage. Now let's hear from their first round opponent. I'm Finnish, um, so we drink week at weekends. I go to school and uh, just have fun with some friends. My parents are kind of surprised that like, I'm going to make money with, with gaming. Yeah, my guild has become a bit like a family. Uh, IBA was, um, was made in the last tournament in Taiwan from two Finnish guilds, Wallando and Lam. Uh, two of those guilds, they decided to make one guild. 
and uh, with eight guys just for this tournament. And that created lots of drama. People didn't talk to each other for a long time. And I don't know what's gonna happen after Leipzig. If people are gonna quit or something, because yeah, we're getting old. <laughs> I'm getting kind of bored of gaming too. I'm, I'm at least I'm gonna take a little break, I guess. In this tournament, we thought about the builds what we're gonna play. We would like get all, all the eight guys in a room and drink some Finnish vodka and thought about the tactics. You have to have some limits, cause you are playing. If you're playing from fifty thousand euros, you don't wanna spoil it by getting drunk. The money it makes people, yeah. It makes everybody play. Irresistible blokes are an aggressive team and they will use this technique to intimidate their opponents. The team was born out of two former European guilds, Valendor and Lum. Since forming, IB has further perfected the European style of tenacious in-your-face warfare. And Izzy, we will see if IB can mesh quickly enough to pick up the victory as they look determined to prove themselves today. While IQ, a primarily American team peppered with a few other nationalities, is going to do whatever it takes to win. Game one is on Druid's Isle as we are set for the Guild Wars faction tournament to get underway. So IB is the blue team, IQ the red team, and Izzy as we take a quick look at the teams getting underway. Do you notice a look at any strategies early on here? Yeah, it definitely seems that uh, IB has pulled out one of their signature moves, which is a, um, a very collapsing team. They use a lot of assassin skills to gain some mobility on the battlefield and use a recall, which allows them to teleport back from one group to the other and collapse on a team, causing a lot of devastation in the middle. A combination of two European teams coming together for this championship tournament. They are known in the past for taking advantage of the opponent's miscues, so IQ is going to try to avoid making it easy for IB in this opening round matchup. Looks like IB's already, you know, well underway. They've got some NPCs down in the very beginning here, and they've also got themselves a morale boost. IQ's going to have to really find something here to pull this one out, as they're already losing. IQ taking losses right from the get-go here in the opening round of the Guild Wars Factions Tournament from Leipzig, Germany. As the fans are looking on intently and curiously, the first game of the tournament underway, 13, over 13 and a half minutes in. Here, this game is being played on Druid's Eye and any characteristics, Izzy, of this specific map that helps either team? Yeah, this is uh, one of the really good maps for them to do the collapse strategy. It's uh, probably one of the favorite maps of the IB team. Really be the tight-knit place, and the way that the middle is really close to the enemy base allows you to teleport between the two extremes. And we see their IB capturing a tower at the 18 minute and 50 second mark as they are controlling the action in game one of this matchup between IB and IQ. There's a look at IQ there, the American team, primarily American team. And then at 22 minutes in, IB gets a morale boost continuing to control the action in this matchup here. Yeah, IB's definitely got a handle on both the flag and the base here. Uh, they're really uh, running I IQ around and getting kills left and right. Ooh, looks like uh, IQ's starting to gain some ground here as they have uh, were able to kill one of the guys in their base. And they're starting to set up a nice body block here at the flag stand. Maybe they'll get a morale boost out of this. IQ in desperate need of a boost to get back in this matchup. Ooh, looks like uh, IB did a nice flag pass off there and was able to stop IQ's ability to get a morale boost. That's going to really hurt them going into the VOD here. And we are getting set. We're getting close and close to VOD. Victory or death. Snare it. Snare, snare this guy, Edson. We mic'd up some of our competitors. Let's listen in to Rain from IQ. When VOD comes and the NPCs come out, we're all going to their base and we're going to blast their lord with everything. I don't think their monks can possibly keep up. I don't think they're built for that. I'm running into the side then. Triple four. Call spike. Call spike now. I'm still charged. Everything on the lord. Don't forget, forget about their players. I don't think they can keep up. So IQ in a last ditch effort here going right for the IB Guild Lord. Looks like they're trying to put all of their damage on this Guild Lord and drain IB's monks out of energy. But it doesn't look like it's paying out for them as IB is quickly just destroying them at this Guild Lord. Move back to the base. Move back to our base for res. Is that a drawback to the strategy when you put all your focus on the Guild Lord? Yeah, you don't you don't have any uh, damage to throw around and to put on their monks or their offense, so it becomes a very simple race. If you can get that Guild Lord down fast enough, or if they can kill you. And it looks like uh, not only did they get captured, they're going to lose a player, so they're going to go into this 7-on-8 coming in their next push. 
an undermanned team as they're trying to hold on here in VOD. IQ against IB. First round matchup of the Guild Wars Faction Championship. Looks like IQ's continuing with this strategy. It seems like it's their only chance. They can't wait this out to 35 minutes when the Guild Lords rush down to the middle. So they're going to have to continue to push on this Guild Lord. But it looks like it's paying off as uh, most of the monks are set up in this game. And they're not too good at keeping that Guild Lord alive. And IQ seems like they're uh, pushing on that Guild Lord with everything they got. But can they hold out? We are just about a minute away from the 35-minute mark, which is key, because that's when the Guild Lords come out. And as IB is starting to sustain some losses here, and a little turnaround now as we take a look at the action. Yeah, IQ's uh, pressure is keeping up here, although they're taking a lot of damage. It seems like they're going to have to stay in it. Oh, they just took a loss. Let's eavesdrop on Rain as he talks to the rest of IQ. Stay on the Lord! Get on the Lord! just dropping left and right and it's it looks like this is almost over ib suffered some serious dps and it looks like that is taking its toll as the guild lord is weakening here when you lose dps you lose your ability to defend and you die much easier so that's what happens there at the just over 35 minute mark a stunning turn of events as iq was able to completely change the game and pick up the victory in game one it really looked like the Finnish players clearly had the match the whole time, and the Americans came and snatched it at the last minute. Uh, we thought we won, and, and there was no communications anymore. And that's the reason why we lost, I think. Uh, now we got to beat them again, and uh, after the last one, I don't know. That was hard, but uh, I've gotten a shaken now. That was rough. When we come back, we'll continue round one action at the Guild Wars Factions Championship in Leipzig, Germany. Welcome back to Leipzig, Germany, and the games convention where we are covering the Guild Wars Factions Championship. We saw a thrilling first match, and if it's any indication of what is to come, then we're in for some great gameplay. Let's recap the first match between IQ and IB. We managed to win game one, which was really tough. They were definitely beating us all the way till the very end of the match and then just sort of pulled it out at the end. Everyone thought Irresistible Blokes was going to win. They were much more aggressive. They kept charging into Idiot Savant's headquarters and killing off their henchmen. Idiot Savants tried to block them doing body blocks where they surround the flag carrier with their characters to prevent them from getting to the watchtowers and they weren't able to do it. However, Idiot Savants was a little clever. 
they ran three warriors, which is a little unusual. Most guilds don't do that. And at the very end, they charged the opponent's guild lord, which nobody saw coming and stole the first match. I hope we can beat them now. I think we deserved the win. We dominated the whole game and then we just lost for nothing. IQ has to figure out how to deal with the aggressive Finns. While IB needs a victory to stay alive, they're going to try to figure out how to finish and avoid crucial mistakes at the end. It's game two, the Finns and the Americans on Isle of Jade. IB in the blue, IQ in the red, IQ looking to finish off IB in advance. And Izzy, what are the uh, distinct characteristics of the map Jade Isle? Well, the map Jade Isle is an extremely kind of straightforward map. It's really hard to sneak around and split on your enemy. This is where you, you change the focus of the battlefield to two locations and really confuse your enemy and pull them around. But uh, when this particular map, it's really easy to fall back and defend your base, so it's really hard to split on. Definitely a smart choice by IQ. So the map favors IQ. Izzy, take us through the strategy of splitting up your team. What are you trying to accomplish when you do that? Well, you're trying to get some pressure on the flag stand and the enemy base so that you can be um, satisfying two goals at once. You can kill some NPCs and get some morale boosts. And by splitting up the enemy team, you really destroy their strategy. Now IB has to come up with a way to advance. What do you notice from their early play? Are they sticking with the aggressive game plan? Yeah, they're definitely keeping up with their aggressive play style. They're running a you know heavy warrior ranger, very physical build here. IQ definitely looks like they've switched off to a way more defensive build, picking up a trapper and uh, continuing to run this new character, the linebacker. The linebacker is being played by Augie, a guy you know well, Izzy. What does he bring to the table as a player? Well, uh, he's had a lot of experience in this game, and uh, his character in this one is being, taking a lot of suppression fire on the uh, enemy warriors. This is really stopping their ability to continue to push in and be very aggressive. Seems like a really smart move by IQ. Two distinctly different builds going at it in this game as IB trying to continue to be aggressive, IQ a defensive nature. We'll see how it plays out here in game two. Yeah, IQ definitely seems like they've stopped a lot of that strong momentum from IB. Now here at the 18 minute mark, it appears IB is going for a split. Izzy, what is that strategy? Well, IB needs to clear out those NPCs so when VOD comes around, they have a nice advantage. But IQ's just staying in there and holding strong and making it really hard for them to get that split. Once again, Isle of Jade makes it really hard to split on. And it appears that IQ is settling to wait around till VOD at the 30 minute mark and then maybe come to play as they're playing a defensive nature here against IB. Yeah, they're just going flag capture after flag capture, just trying to stall out IB, not really trying to make any aggressive nature whatsoever. They're playing real passive here. Now, if you're IB, how do you try to take advantage of that passive nature? What do you do? Well, you're going to have to really figure out what they're doing to shut you down so that you can overcome it and get that aggressive momentum going. So uh, it looks like IB's still picking up some morale boosts, and that should be giving them a chance here, but IQ's continued defense is just slowing them down. We are getting closer and closer to VOD, victory or death, as IB is looking to stay alive in the Guild Wars Faction Championship against the American team, IQ. So uh, IQ's going into this pretty much dead even. They've maybe lost one NPC here, if that. And, uh, you know, they've lost a little bit of morale, but not a lot of deaths have happened, so it doesn't matter. And we are now in victory or death, and we'll, we will take a look to see whose strategy pays off here. <clears throat> So here's uh, Augie beating down on those Warriors, really pushing that linebacker. It's really causing them a lot of problems and stopping their ability to spike. It, it looks like IQ's rounding up all of the enemy's NPCs. You can see all those dots clumping up there. Let's listen in to Rain from IQ. Meteor shower the stairs, I'm blocking it. I'm trapping the stairs, so if they try to run down, they're not gonna make it. I think they're dropping a meteor shower and wiping all of those NPCs up there. It appears their strategy to hold off is working. Meteor Shower, a rarely used skill in this game. Yeah, it seems like it is cleaning all of Ivy's NPCs and dropping them down. Looks like IQ is going to take a huge NPC advantage here. IB in a panic move is going to try to go for a gank now that they've lost all of their NPCs. And they're running across that Jade Coral and IQ is just cutting them down. Take us back to Augie the linebacker and the damage he's doing now. Well, he's been really keeping these uh, warriors underway, and here's Fly, one of the warriors from the enemy team, trying to get a Guild Lord gank. But here's Augie coming right down and just stopping him dead in his tracks. Oh, that's got to hurt. That was an emphatic move by Augie the linebacker, and he's letting them know about it there, having fun with the kill. It's pretty insulting there. The IB's hurting. They're uh, down NPCs, their ganks are failing, they're losing morale boosts. 
I don't know. It, it, I'm, I'm favoring IQ on this one. IQ has once again gained momentum late after sort of sitting around passively for almost the first 30 minutes of the game. Now they have control of this one as we are at the 34-minute, 22nd mark of game two. Yeah, it looks like IB's only chance here is to come out with their Guild Lord strong, clean up some NPCs, and start getting some kills, start building some momentum. They're just stopped dead in their tracks by IQ's defense. Let's go back a little bit to the Meteor Shower. What, how effect, why was that so effective? Well, it looked like IQ hit it the whole game, so no one knew it was there. And by rounding up all the NPCs and hitting them with a Meteor Shower, they were able to kill them all at the same time. Opening up the playing field for IQ at victory or death, and they are taking advantage of it, and they continue to take advantage of it as they are starting to grab control of this game. They're looking to go for the elimination of IB. Yeah, it looks like that huge NPC advantage there is just cutting IB down. They just cannot handle the offense from all those NPCs. And they don't have a choice at this point because it's it's the end of the game. So it appears that IQ is on its way. IB starting to weaken. Can IB somehow muster enough strength here to force a game three? Yeah, Ivy's got to get some NPCs down and or some players or something. If they don't, you know, change the pace around, they're, they're almost dead. There's three of them up and their guild lords taking damage. They're about to lose it. 37 minutes, 36 seconds. IQ is now on the verge of a victory here in the first round of the Guild Wars Factions Championship. Looking to advance into the semifinals, it appears to be inevitable, a victory, and there it is. Oh! That was a really uh, surprising game there. IQ seemed like they were stalling the whole game, and they just pulled it out right in the end. A big upset. Idiot Savants was the team that came in through winning the Open. They didn't even come in through the regular seasons. So there were a lot of people that thought, did they deserve to be here? We should have won the first game. But yeah, that's that's Guild Wars. But they ran a sneaky trick. They had an elementalist that had meteor shower that he had a, the ability to cast it very quickly. They didn't use it the entire battle. They kept it hidden until at the very end. I thought, really game two, I, we really thought we had a really good strategy for that, so we were really confident. Um, but we definitely did not want to go to game three because we sort of didn't plan that far. So <laughs> we had sort of been ad hocing it at that point. Yeah, we all are disappointed. I don't know, I was pretty confident on winning the game. But yeah, they, they, were, they played really well and um, we made some bad mistakes. We lost. <laughs> the first match is an upset. But as we said before, the field is wide open here in Leipzig. It's an exciting time for the game in its first year of competitive play, as some of these teams face off for the first time ever. In fact, some of the teams are meeting their own teammates in person for the first time ever. Let's hear a little bit from the players as to why they choose to play Guild Wars over all the rest. I think the best thing about Guild Wars is it's so easy when you know what you're going to get into it. Guild Wars itself is uh, a game very much based on perfection and um, timing. Yeah, Guild Wars is the only advanced player versus player game. There are no games like that. It's similar to an FPS in that you have to have the really quick reaction skills, but at the same time it's also very strategic. And so it kind of melds those two really well. So that's that's really why I find it so fun. You have the levels, you have the characters, you have the classes. You can create any different character. Most games like this, online roleplay games, you level your character up, you have to spend a long, long time getting equipment for it. For the Guild Wars you can play whatever you want, when you want. Usually they'll have warriors or in there, you know, the the meat beaters. The warriors tend to get angry a lot when they can't hit things. They have the soft guys that kind of support the warriors, and then they have the back line that heals. I play Monk, which is a defensive character, and it's really hard to tell what the monks are doing. Uh, either everyone's staying alive or they're dying. Necromancers gain energy when stuff dies. So necromancers can heal, have a lot of energy to heal with, and still do damage. So they keep things alive, and they kill people, basically. One of the things I decided when I created the guild is it can always be for fun. Yes, there's days that we'll tell each other we hate one another and never want to see or hear them again. It's kind of like family, you know? So I really enjoy the camaraderie of being in a guild, especially a competitive guild. It definitely has its ups and downs, but overall it's really fun. And then, of course, culminating in these trips, which are awesome. So if you can make it to the trips, then it makes it all worthwhile. 
Next up, we bring you the second featured matchup of round one, as Treacherous Empire from the United States takes on the mixed European squad, Esoteric Warriors. More exciting gameplay awaits when we come back to Leipzig, Germany for the Guild Wars Factions Championship. Welcome back to Leipzig, Germany and the Games Convention for the Guild Wars Factions Championship. Let's go down and meet the next two teams about to square off. The name of the guild is Esoteric Warriors. I think esoteric itself means hard to understand, but we don't quite understand what it means, so it sort of explains itself in a way. Hmm, what do I do? I fence occasionally. I fence a lot at university, I haven't done it as much since. It's just something to pass the time and not get too horribly unfit playing computer games. My girlfriend doesn't play this game, plays another game, uh, Dark Age of Camelot, one I used to play a lot before this. I don't think it would make much difference if she played the game, but at the same time, it's good to be able to escape occasionally. Why well, I didn't say that. Esoteric Warriors came together initially, it was sort of a Tombs Guild. So I joined the Guild about then, a few others joined the Guild recently after, and we started playing GVG a lot. And it turned out to be alright at it. There was never any real plan to be particularly good at it. We're all officers, there's no real sort of leader. Like some of the guilds, I think the Koreans and TE have a very specific leader. Um, people have to do what he says and stuff like that. And when we were practicing for this, we've never really played it seriously. We just grabbed whoever was online, thought, oh, let's play this, we'll try it. Died a lot, ran around in circles, had a laugh. The thing about EW is that they have a very loose style. This leaderless quality is unique and it works for them. They are extraordinarily good at spiking, in particular, the FOC spike. Now let's hear from their first round opponent. The name of my team is Treacherous Empire. I am from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, from the US. Uh, a long way from home here. Had about 28 hours of travel time. Well, for nine months, I eat, sleep, and play video games in the dark. I do snowboarding in the winter. Fairbanks, it's just a lot of big hills, and there's uh, very, very low humidity. It's actually considered a desert, uh, less than 10 inches precipitation a year. Living in Alaska doesn't make you a good snowboarder. <laughs> Games have always been a form of entertainment to me, and um, you know, growing up and going onward, I never expected to do any sort of professional gaming. Um, I just, I just always feel like if you take, you have a passion, and if you drill it like a job, like in a professional situation, <laughs> you, you know, you won't enjoy it anymore. We enjoy winning, and we have fun when we win, but. If we lose, you know, we're, we're not going to trash each other out. Uh, money, money's great, but we're just glad to be here. TE utilizes various techniques and builds to take down their opponents because they don't rely on specific tactics. Also, look for them to dominate flag control, one of this team's strongest assets. My prediction is that they'll be hard to predict. So Izzy, let's get ready. It's EW with their mixed roster taking on TE from the United States. An exciting matchup as we begin game one on Warriors Isle. 
T is the red team in this matchup. EW, the blue team. EW, the higher seed, so they got first selection of maps. Isaiah, they go with Warrior's Isle. What are the distinct characteristics of this map? Well, the big thing about this map is it has a catapult. It really allows you to uh, put some pressure on the NPCs at VOD and maybe wipe them all out. And uh, it's also a really good map for splitting, allowing both teams to sneak around the back and put some pressure on the enemy base. You notice anything particular from the builds and what these two teams are going to try to do early? Um, they both got some pretty balanced builds here. It looks like uh, EW is running a bit of a hex build, but uh, TE seems well prepared. We're seeing a lot of TE strong flag control here, and EW is matching up well. They're pretty much keeping dead even on flags, and here it's around the 30 minute mark, and no one has gotten a morale boost yet. What exactly are morale boosts? All right, morale boosts are a, uh, an increase to your team's defenses. It increases your health and your energy, and it also recharges all your uh, resurrection signets. These are what allow you to bring your players back extremely fast and not have to wait for the two-minute timer. Here we are. We're at the VOD. Victory or death 30 minutes into the game. Yeah, so it looks like TE's strategy here is they've gotten the catapult repaired, and they're probably going to try to make a strong push up here if they can keep their aggressive nature up. Ooh, and it looks like Trex is holding all those NPCs in. You can see all those dots clumping up there while they catapult them to death. This is a huge advantage to TE as they're going to have a crazy NPC advantage going into VOD. So after a feeling out process of almost the entire first 30 minutes, it appears now that TE has sort of grabbed the first advantage of this game. So EW is going to have to come up with a, a strong uh, strategy here as it looks like TE's got the middle under control. This is going to get them some morale boost and I don't know what I don't know what EW's going to do. Does it appear that EW is going to have to go for a gank, sort of a last ditch effort here to stay alive in this match? Yeah, I think that's what's going to have to happen here because uh, they can't stand toe to toe with those NPCs without taking them down fast. And with a hex build, they, they're, the hexes are slow degen, so it's not a lot of fast damage. So they're going to have to push past those NPCs and go for a gank, which is where you sneak around the backside and attack the Guild Lord undefended. So let's see if TE can finish them off before they can get to that gank. We are in victory or death. Treacherous Empire in control of this match as they try to finish off and gain an early advantage by taking game one against EW. EW sitting here holding back. They just gave TE one of their first morale boosts. Let's hear what Trex has to say as we listen in. Car, you watching the base? Car, I want you to watch that base. Hold back, hold back. Keep going back, keep going back. Looks like EW's making a book for the gank. TE had grabbed control, the first control of the match, right at victory or death as they took advantage of the catapult and the, their hex build. Now we're approaching the 35 minute mark. EW looks like looks to be going for a gank to get back in this game. Yeah, it looks like uh, TE's not exactly sure what they're going to do. They're all falling back to defend their guild lord. They're not sending any offense whatsoever. So they're losing all of their advantage at that flag. You seemed a little uh, surprised by that strategy there after they sort of grabbed control of the game. Yeah, I mean, most teams really try to split up, sending some defense back to slow down the team and some offense to try to finish off the guild lord. But it looks like TE's indecision here in the end is going to really hurt them. Maybe they're going to send someone back. So now EW is in a great position here after sort of giving up control of the match at victory or death, but they have regained it. The gank has sort of achieved its objective here for EW as we are at past the 35-minute mark. Yeah, the pressure seems to be keeping up on TE as they made a decision to send Bob back to the uh, flag stand to try to work on the Guild Lord. And uh, this one person down is giving EW the advantage they need. They're slowly starting to pick off players and their pressure is really starting to keep up. So here's Bob beating on the Guild Lord. Uh, I don't know if one player is going to be able to make a dent in there. They need to really send back two. And I don't think those seven players are going to be able to do anything back to that Guild Lord. So TE really needs to shape up here and you know, follow a strategy. So EW now approaching the Guild Lord looking to take advantage here and finish off this game one. This is game one of an opening round match of the Guild Wars Factions Championship, TE against EW. Looks like EW's pressure build and hexes are really starting to stack up as TE's just starting to take drops. I don't know if they're going to be able to keep it up as uh, they've got some of their monks down and that Guild Lord's starting to really take some damage. So now EW on the cusp of victory here after looking like they had lost control at victory or death, the gank has worked 
worked, and now they are hammering away at the Guild Lord. Yeah, TE's unable to keep up with this pressure of EW and is slowly starting to take losses, and that Guild Lord's health is just going down fast. It's a slugfest going all EW's way here. Late, the Guild Lord is fading. It's now not a question of if, but when, and there the Guild Lord goes down. EW comes up with the victory in game one. It was a surprising turnaround for EW as they looked like they were down. T looked overwhelmed. I think their indecision at the end cost them that round. For 30 minutes, they went back and forth. No morale. It stayed even the entire 30-minute match. What happened at the end, though, was they, they rushed our Guild Lord, and instead of us sending the offense to their Guild Lord and just finishing the game, we made, we made a really stupid call, and I'm going to be honest, I think the crowd just took over our spirits. We made a stupid call to just go back and try to defend our Guild Lord. And we made the same mistake that we just saw two hours earlier with IB versus IQ, where IB goes back to defend their Guild Lord, and they just eventually, the pressure gets to him, and their Guild Lord goes down. It was a really rough loss. Treacherous Empire was a little upset. They thought they had that match. They're off planning now. I have no idea what they're going to do. This next match, we actually had this all pre-planned out last night. This next match, we're going to just keep it, keep it to plan. We have the map planned out. We're going to run our split build. And we, we, you know, we have assassins. We got a bunch of crazy lined up for this next match. It's going to be good stuff. TE walked off the stage. Now they're coming back from that much-needed team meeting. They're going to go with the split build in game two. EW doesn't need to change it up. Map two is on Nomad's Isle. So we move on to game two, Nomad's Isle, EW in red, TE in blue. EW making some small tweaks to its build. TE selecting a rare map, Izzy. Yeah, it looks like EW switched up and has gone with a smiter and a ritualist. <laughs> TE probably has got some plans because this is a real interesting rare build. The quicksand in the middle of this uh, map really slows down the energy of your enemies every time they attack or use a skill, they lose some energy. Elaborate on the effectiveness and how quicksand changes the game. Well, um, when you're in the middle of that quicksand, if you haven't built for it, it's really hard on your energy. So um, they can, TE can really pull the enemy into that quicksand as they look like they've been prepared for it and uh, really make it hard for them to get that flag through. TE getting their first morale boost. You can see one of, one of TE's strengths in this game is strong flag control, especially on this map where they've been well prepared. Yeah, it looks like they're doing real well here and keeping uh, EW at bay. EW haven't used their Ritualist. Uh, this character drops defensive skills and spirits who protect your whole team. Um, they're, they're positioning that uh, Ritualist in the middle to try to stop TE's split. TE's split is sneaking around back through the teleporter and trying to kill some NPCs. TE's doing a real good job of pinning that flag runner through that quicksand and really slowing them down with ice hexes and ice snares. Yeah. What adjustments do you think EW is going to try to do here with the choice of map in the quicksand? I think they're going to have to move that ritualist up to the top and try to protect both their offensive and their defensive team to deal with that split and to try to get that flag runner out of there. They're going to have to really get some flag control and some morale boost to stay in this game and protect those NPCs. And it looks like TE's assassin, the character known as Sheep, is starting to cause some serious damage up top, is he? Yeah, he's using his shadow step to get up top there and get those NPCs that they weren't able to get around the first time. Assassins are a new uh, character for factions. They really uh, add a lot of mobility to the table. They can get in and get out of combat extremely quickly, but they're very weak. So once they're in there, if they take a lot of damage, they got to get out quick. EW doing a good job of keeping the split out of the base, it appears, not allowing TE to pick up too many NPC kills here at the 19 minute mark. Yeah, TE's getting a couple NPCs and they're really able to, you know, get going, but not as many as they wanted. EW's uh, rich list is really helping them keep some defense up there. So TE acquiring some morale boosts, but not getting any further pushes in advance. Yeah, EW's, uh, you know, keeping them here at bay and making sure that that split isn't wreaking too much havoc in their base. This game's going to really have to play out at VOD for EW to gain back some advantage. We advance past the 28-minute mark as we approach VOD, victory or death. Who's set up better, you think, Izzy, for the VOD period? Well, it uh, looks like TE's got some morale boosts and uh, have gotten quite a few NPCs down, so they're definitely going to be set up a little bit better for VOD. EW's going to really have to clean out TE's NPCs quickly before they're going to be able to get their advantage back. So we are now in victory or death. 
T.E. needs a win here to survive. And Izzy, it appears T.E. split is starting to pay dividends as they now have a rare opportunity to pull the bodyguards out. Yeah, it looks like they got both the bodyguards down there and they're starting to degen out. They get one of them down, but can't quite get the other one before Sheep dies. But luckily the degen pays off there and cleans them both dead. EW looking to advance, T.E. looking to stay alive. This is game two of an opening round match of the Guild Wars Factions Championship from Leipzig, Germany. Looks like uh, TE was able to push EW back to the base and was starting to work on their guild lord. But I think EW might get the resurrect in time to save him. So EW doing a good job of pushing back the TE assault. Just over two minutes in to the victory or death period. TE looking to finish it off, but EW doing a good job there of pushing them back and saving the Guild Lord. Yeah, EW resurrected just in time, barely getting out of there, but still taking some losses as TE tries to retreat out of the base and turn him for a spike. Let's eavesdrop on Paladin as he talks to his TE teammates. Oh, careful guys! They're falling back, they're falling. They're gonna want to fight us in the middle. We need their Guild Lord to get all the way to their our NPCs. They're trying to get to our guild lord! The guild lord's going into our NPCs! Looks like EW is going to try to use their guild lord to kill some NPCs by buffing them up with some smite enchantments. What exactly does smite bring to the table? Smite allows you to do some AoE damage, area of effect, and increase the damage of your guild lord by dropping some enchantments on him. But doesn't look like it's paying off for EW as that huge NPC control by TE is really starting to take its toll. So TE on the verge of staying alive in this tournament, the map selection paying off, the strategy paying off. Their guild lord's about to go down. All those NPCs are just tearing him up. And there it is. TE kills off the guild lord to force a do or die game three. A much better showing from TE, and they are pumped. TE able to completely dictate the flow of the map as they take game two from EW. So it's all coming down to one final game. The winner will go on to face War Machine, while the loser gets to do a little sightseeing. Game three between Treacherous Empire and Esoteric Warriors when we come back to the Guild Wars Factions Championship in Leipzig, Germany. We are back at the Guild Wars Factions Championship, and if you're just joining us, you're in for some all-star gameplay. From the United States, it's Treacherous Empire, taking on Europe's own Esoteric Warriors in the third and decisive game. Let's head down to the floor as the match is about to start. So Treacherous Empire, early in the game, captured the flags and maintained a morale bonus throughout the whole game. When all the NPCs started marching in, they had the numbers advantage and were able to defeat the Esoteric Warriors Guild Lord. By the end of the game, too, that was about the two-hour mark, um, we were exhausted. I mean, you could see sweat pouring off the players' faces. He had the crowd yelling at us, you know, all the stresses of you know, not making a mistake. And everyone's nervous here at the World Championship. They're playing for a lot of money. It'll be really interesting to see what they come up with. T 
LTE's strategy really paid off there. They were controlling the whole game. Going into game three, they are prepared for EW. But EW hasn't pulled out their signature strategy yet, so we'll see how well TE prepares for that. The last battle was really tough on EW's build, so it is time to go back to what they know. The question is, does TE know what is coming? Map three is on Burning Isle. It is a do or die game three between TE in the red, EW will be in the blue, and Izzy, we've been mentioning that EW's signature strategy is the FOC spike, and you are expecting them to go to that early in this one. Yeah, FOC spike, the Feast of Corruption, is kind of their signature move. No one's really able to pull it off quite like them because it takes a lot of offense and defense. You really got to be able to play these characters in two different ways. Um, FOC is a curse spell that allows you to do AoE damage, so you can really wipe a team quick, and as we can see, see here, EW's getting up some great momentum in the beginning of this game and getting some choice kills early on, pushing TE back to their base. EW grabbing control of this third and decisive game against TE, looking to advance in the Guild Wars Factions Championship. We are just past the three minute mark here on the Burning Isle map. Looks like EW's pushing into those NPCs trying to get a kill. They've gotten their first morale boost of this game. Morale boost so key that teams like to store them up so that they can have them down in crunch time, have plenty of energy left for the crucial matters of the battle. Looks like EW's just aggroed the bodyguards, and when they aggro them is when they pull in the, the NPCs and get their attention onto them. You can usually add a lot of defense and offense depending on where you are. So, so far in this game, it appears that EW has made the proper adjustments, and now uh, quite a strategy move there by EW, Izzy. Looks like they dropped a frozen soil, which is turning this whole game around for them as they took one death and weren't able to resurrect their own player. Frozen soil stops all resurrections from happening. TE completely taking advantage of that mistake and pushing forward. Now, why would EW, when in complete control, try a move like that? It was just a silly mistake. You normally want to drop that when you're beaten on the enemy and not when you're losing. It looks like TE's pushed them all the way back to EW's base and is trying to end this game early. So once again, we see how important a role strategy can play in this matchup as EW makes a questionable move, allowing TE now to gain momentum in this game three. Although it looks like EW was able to resurrect in time and save their guild lord and is now pushing TE back. So a back and forth affair here in game three on Burning Isle. Treacherous Empire against the Esoteric Warriors. Looks like Trex has snuck around back, cleaned off the Fire Sentinels. These things are what guard the back path and stop splitting to happen early on in the game. But now it's opened up and so he's able to harass the NPCs and apply some pressure. Let's hear what Paladin has to say as we listen in. Okay, pull back, pull, pull back. We have this game of VOD, let's just get back. It's safe now, right? We got the morale. I think we can beat them straight up, guys. They don't have any NPCs, can we? And then their guild lord's gotta come out eventually, and we'll beat them with the NPCs. I doubt they're gonna split. They have to stick with their guild lord or else they're gonna lose. Now we are rapidly approaching VOD, victory or death in a decisive game three. It doesn't get any more tense than this in Guild Wars. Looks like TE's decision to throw in a cry of frustration by Krieger is really paying off for them as they've been able to shut down EW's FOC spike over and over. What are you trying to accomplish with the cries of frustration? Cry of frustration interrupts your target and everyone around them. So when, you're, when your enemies are all focusing one spell on you, you can really disrupt them all. So a quality move by Krieger there to come up with the cry of frustration at just the right time as Red picks up a morale boost that goes T's way. Yeah, every single morale boost is really crucial in this game as it allows TE to take more deaths and be more aggressive against this FOC spike. So it's a question of momentum now as this game continues to go back and forth. We have just gone past one minute of VOD between Treacherous Empire and Esoteric Warriors. TE's gotten the NPC advantage and is really pushing back onto EW. EW's kind of back into their base and trying not to crumble. So who will crumble? That is the question now as we are running out of time in a decisive game three at the Guild Wars Factions Championship from Leipzig, Germany. Looks like EW got a really choice kill there on Krieger forcing TE to push back. Without that cry of frustration, they are easy pickings. TE's having to fall back quickly. So TE now on its heels as EW makes a turn and picks up some key spikes and regains momentum. So EW making a push, looking to take advantage of Krieger going down. 
We are approaching the 33 minute mark of this battle. Yeah, TE falling back to those NPCs, trying to stop EW's momentum from building. So EW sort of gaining back the momentum here. 33 minutes and 44 seconds in. There was a nice key cry of frustration by Krieger. That really shows exactly what that spell does. Krieger continuing to be the main player for TE in this one. Yeah, EW's gotten a, you know, a hint of that, and they're trying to spike him out. As soon as they get Krieger down, they can put some real aggression on TE. And there they go. They're getting another uh, kill here and there. TE's got to be really careful about those spikes. Well, everybody's going to have to be really careful now as we are running out of time in the decisive game three between TE and EW. Izzy, what should we look for down here in crunch time? Well, it looks like the Guild Lords have advanced and joined into this final melee here at the end of the game. TE picking up another morale boost once again, just keeping them alive. Let's listen in to Paladin as he talks to his TE teammates. Please keep us up, Monks are doing great. We're about to win, let's do this. Yeah. This one, good side, good side, good three. Two, one, Friday the out on that Guild Lord boss, it's all yours, please do it. TE going for the kill and looking to advance as they continue to hammer away at EW's Guild Lord. The Guild Lord is fading. The Guild Lord is fading, he is down, and it is over. TE captures game three and advances to the semifinals. The ability to read EW strategy was key, and of course, Krieger's use of the cry of frustration. Now that is cause for celebration. It was intense, I'll give you that, but we did enjoy it. We did not know we would won until I saw the victory screen pop up online. I was so busy and into the game, I couldn't focus on what else was happening on uh, the other half of the field. But as soon as the crowd started screaming and uh, waving their flags in our faces and uh, you know just the hysteria going off, uh, that's when we realized we won. And then once we won, of course we celebrate and scream and we're very robust and wild guild. We lost because of us rather than the opponent. It's fine losing to someone who outplays you, it's losing to yourselves, but it's not. At the last minute, one of the players from Treacherous Empire was nervous about Blood Spike because Esoteric Warriors is known for pulling that out occasionally. No one had really played it before. There's only one team played it before, which we stole it from. And it just seemed to work. Um, maybe we should have practiced it a tiny bit. We only won because I made a lucky skill change at the last second. I put in Cry of Frustration instead of Power Drain. That probably saved us, so it was just dumb luck. Um, things happen. And I guess it would be my philosophy. There's no reason to go around worrying about it too much. Tomorrow, we fight another team that's War Machine. Um, try our chances there and celebrate again if we win. Go party if we lose. <laughs> War Machine goes into the match as the heavy favorite. They've been here before, and as professionals who practice more than 10 hours a day, they expect to win. Their huge fan base can't hurt either. But you can't count out those pesky Americans. Both Treacherous Empire and Idiot Savants found a way to beat the Europeans, and their passion for the game just may take them all the way to Guild Wars glory and the $50,000 first prize. They've got to get by the Koreans first, as Last Pride and War Machine stand in their way. Join us next time for the semifinals at the Guild Wars Factions Championship in Leipzig, Germany.